Okay, I think we're going to get started. Um, pleasure to introduce Amy, um, who's going to talk to us about UX in audio tech. So, big round of applause for Amy. Hello. Can everybody hear me okay? Great. Yes. Okay, so yeah, my name is Amy Dickens. I'm a web developer advocate at Samsung Internet, and I'm also a PhD researcher at the Mixed Reality Laboratory, which is at the University of Nottingham. And I'm here to talk to you today about user experience of audio technologies. Or I was. Hang on. It's run out of battery. We'll have to do it old school. OK. OK, so I started out, as uh, many of you might have done in this room, as a curious musician. I played the piano from the age of four. I wanted to uh, write my own songs. I got really bored of learning to do grades when I was 14 and stopped going to see my piano teacher once a week because she essentially told me that I was wasting her time. <laughs> so I became really interested in what I could do with sounds and other things. I had um, one of these Yamaha Clavinova pianos. Anybody remember those? Like a relic of the 90s that you could put floppy disks into and do follow the notes and also record your own songs. So I started learning how to record and make music from quite a young age, actually, and like how to layer things and add parts and, and break things down and mess around with synthesis. And when I actually went to do a diploma in songwriting in Brighton, I started to learn that I was really, really interested in being part of the audio engineering world. I started with a sequel, actually, which is like the garage band of Cubase, I guess. Um, that's where I started to record. And I was one of those really non-techy musician types who didn't understand that when I did a direct line in microphone into my uh, Dell laptop with very low RAM, that it, it didn't actually uh, record with no latency. I couldn't understand why the, there was a delay in my headphones. Um, so when I started learning about audio engineering, I uh, started a degree in it in 2010. I, I then realized like just how much there was to uh, digital signal processing and all of the wonderful things that happened in music tech. And when I started going from that realm, in my last year of my degree, I learned how to do uh, some rudimentary programming using Flash action, action Script. Um, everybody start a language, right? <laughs> um, but that was where I started learning how to make interactive things. And I thought, well, with coding, surely we can make interactions with music more interesting. And we can start looking at making interactions more accessible. And I proposed to the University of Nottingham that I do a PhD in designing accessible instruments and looking at ways of creating novel interfaces that would allow us to use many things like gesture, or different input methodologies to create sounds. So I became a computer scientist, strangely. So there was this huge jump from being a musician with no technical prowess whatsoever to being a trained studio engineer and live engineer to then joining the world of programming and being a computer scientist. When I was doing that work, I found, like my days in the studio, where I would often be the only woman in the room, I felt the same in computer science. I would go to hackathons and, and be one of a handful. I would be able to never have to queue in a lady's bathroom, which is both a blessing, but also disappointing. And so I, I felt um, the need to start raising the voices of people like me who weren't as well represented in the industry and I became an ambassador for women in tech. And that led me to get a job as a web developer advocate. So now I mess around with making the web a more accessible place, and also occasionally get to do fun things with web audio or other stuff that, that piques my interest. And this is Samsung Internet, um, who I currently work for. 
And my, my focus in their team is on accessible web technologies and how to make the web more accessible. Uh, I also talk on open source software, Git, as I was a GitHub campus expert for the last two years, and uh, web audio, and I'll soon be venturing into progressive web apps. So wish me luck with that one. But I'm here today because I'm going to talk to you about the things I've learned in my last three years with the lovely folks at the Mixed Reality Lab. I've been conducting research there for three years with different community groups around Nottinghamshire in looking at accessible digital instruments. Or if you prefer the long title, facilitated performance with digital musical instruments for users with complex disabilities, the academic light. <laughs> So I'm about to write my thesis on this, and I'm part of the Fusing Audio and Semantic Technologies project, which is the FAST project. And next year, I'll be helping with chairing the ACM Audio Mostly conference as well. But what does that research look like? Well, here is a picture um, of uh, the Able Orchestra from Inspire Culture. And this is us performing at the BBC Proms in 2016, um, so just one year into my research, uh, where we took technologies to young communities with uh, a range of complex needs and helped them to perform with a live orchestra using technology. Uh, we called it the, the Able Orchestra. Uh, the Ableton was the main uh, door that we were using to send all of the MIDI controls from iPads. I also hacked together a, a gesture controller using the Leap Motion to go into this as well. So, we were testing what user requirements were like in these kind of community events, and how could we make this access to music better? And that's what I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about today. I'm gonna to talk to you about user experience in digital audio technologies. I'm gonna talk about the development of digital music making a little bit, like a brief look at the history and the kind of interfaces that we've come from and what that informs today. I'm going to talk about making music digitally, editing music digitally, and audio technology and the user experience. And then I'm going to give you some techniques for designing simple and effective UX. Before we begin, though, and this is always a risk when you're doing a public speaking thing, but I would like some involvement from you. Don't worry, you don't have to stand up. I'm not going to make you do a dance, anything like that. But I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. So you just center on yourself for a moment. And I'd like you to take your hands, and I'd like you to link your fingers together in front of you, just on your lap, and cross over your thumbs. Just settle in how that feels right now. And now I'd like you to cross over your thumbs the other way around. A little bit uncomfortable. OK. So let's shake those arms out and just fold your arms for me. OK, just a minute there. Fold them the other way. It's a little more tricky, isn't it? You can open your eyes now. This is kind of what we need to understand about user experiences. Everything we do with technology is a very personal, individual experience. And for some of us who can't fold our arms the other way, things can be a little more frustrating than somebody that that comes naturally to. And so whilst a, a user experience or a UI or, a some, or any kind of element of technology might make sense to you, it's important to understand how personal that is and that isn't going to transfer to the person sitting next to you. So let's understand a little bit about digital music making. Does anybody recognize this guy? Alan Bumlein. So started in audio with telecommunications, and moved on to patent the audio recording technologies, or stereo audio recording. And after that, he began developing radar systems, and unfortunately, he died testing those in World War II. So when he patented stereo recording, it was 1933. Little did he know that like 80 odd years on, we would have the ability to carry stereo audio multi-track recording studio in our pocket. It's come a huge, huge way. Moving forward a few years, and we saw uh, Ampex releasing multi-track recorders to certain artists and studios. And then we see um, in the 70s developments of doors becoming a thing. 
computer audio becoming a thing. And whilst all of that was happening, we had synthesizers going from very rudimentary controls to generating polyphonic sound. We had pioneers like the BBC Radiophonic Workshop building weird sounds that people had never heard before. We had radio shows like the War of the Worlds that were literally scaring people because they'd never heard that sound before. Sound was developing in a really, really fast pace. And in 1979, we had the uh, Fairlight computer music instrument. So the first time that we really called something a computer music instrument. And if you've never seen one of these in action, uh, please search on YouTube the Herbie Hancock um, with the like jams with the CMI video on YouTube because it's just pure gold to see him explaining this technology and touching this and hearing the whir of the computer while it boots the memory to load in the sound and all of the patience that people had back in the day to wait like sometimes up to two minutes for a sound thing to load and now we barely take two seconds and then we're frustrated. So it was, it was even at this early stage in technology's development that Herbie himself identified one of the key issues that people who design technology face um, when we introduce things to this field is that people always blame machines and he said, how can it be the machine's fault? We gotta plug it in. Like, it doesn't plug itself in, it doesn't play itself, it doesn't program itself. Yet we, you know, we have to learn them. And he, he did even say, like, well, it doesn't program itself yet. He foresaw that maybe AI, maybe something else would be doing things like this in the future. And we do have to learn these technologies. We do, there is a certain level of mastery that we have to acquire when we're moving forward. And we have to learn how to make them make the sounds that we want. But if that's not an easy interaction, for designers who develop these technologies, people will essentially say it's broken if it doesn't work the way they expect it to. So moving forward, the 1980s brought out like uh, visual audio programming with languages like Kaima and Max becoming a thing. And this was like spurring on a new genre of music as well, a different way to create things. Uh, and this was born out of these programs. And then we saw that the 1990s introduced the door to the home recording studio, that you could have a computer with recording software on it. That's pretty cool. Um, Cubase and Logic were early 90s products first released and then went on to become more mainstream. And if we take... a uh, a step forward now to closer to this year, we have come, like, we just have to jump 20 years and we've already seen that we've entered a smart device decade where it's possible to have these technologies that we painstakingly code in the palm of your hand on any device. And music's now a mobile thing. We can put the technology at the fingertips of somebody, they can download an application and be making something new in minutes. And that's mean, that means that there's loads of developments for how we can not just make music, but edit and consume music. And some of the thinking around design has to catch up to that as well. So instead of now the privileged few that have, were lucky enough to have an Atari with Cubase or something similar, it means that we have people who can access technology from all walks of life, whether they're a performer, whether they're a complete novice, they can download and start working straight away, whether they're a hobbyist, or whether they're a, an audio expert, like many of you in the room, whether they know all of that things, and then all of the people in between. The user group for audio technology is constantly growing, and we need to be very, very aware of that. So what does knowing the quick like that was very brief audio history, <laughs> but what does knowing a quick thing of how much technology has changed in this lifetime actually inform us about UX? Well, it helps us to understand things like the common ground. Between music making, recording, editing, there are things that speak a universal language. There are tools that we would use in all of those. There are like the, the physics that we refer to sound, electronics and cultural expectations that we, ex we see in music all inform what the user experience could be. 
So let's take a look at these three areas. We have digital musical instruments, we have visual audio programming, and digital audio workstation. What can we see that's similar in those areas? Well, first of all, we generally see that there's input and output. Whether it's a key press input, whether it's a line in, whatever we're seeing, we see that there's some forms of input from a user generating output from their actions. And there's a causality relationship in that that we need to be very aware of. Secondly, we have parameters. Parameters uh, are the things that we are likely to have some kind of settings or that the user can manipulate a change, whether that's a choice of voice on a digital instrument or the style of automation that you want to use when editing in your door. And third is that there's always gonna be some form of active control or a way to signify active control. What am I interacting with at this moment in time? Do we do that through visual feedback? If any of you have played on the, the Roly Light Blocks, there's, very, there's visual feedback when you press on them. How do we decide what that looks like? How do we decide what that feedback is? Maybe it's a focus element in your visual programming language so you know what object you're changing, or maybe it's um, around the input parameter of the effect in your, in your door. But then there's also context. We need to understand what the user is trying to do when we interact with each of these technologies. You might think in uh, writing code for your, for your app or what, whatever it is gonna be the output, that you don't really need to think about all of these things. But there might be some kind of snag in the design point where it hasn't really thought about context switching, would the person want to have this option or this piece of code or this here right now? How important is that to the interaction and what are they doing? We spend a lot of time about thinking how people interact with technology. Uh, mostly this is in audio terms, editing and programming. We're tweaking things, we're very much involved in using the technology and interacting with it to achieve what we want. When recording and mixing and editing audio, we're rarely thinking about like a scenario like live performance, unless we're doing like live music programming or something like that, where you're, where you're doing something um, with a technology and displaying that to people. Um, though, that said, it's still a place where we execute creative agency, and it's still a place where we want to demonstrate mastery and through, like, through the choices of our processes. So there is still like an artistic, creative element to that. In the case of digital musical instruments, we're very much thinking about interacting through technology. And in a lot of technologies, the audience needs to comprehend what you're doing with that. We see this with electronic musicians where there's this problem of the causality relationship is a bit broken. I could be DJing, I could be checking my email. Those are the issues that we want to try and combat when we're looking at interacting through technology. We want the technology to seem virtuous. We want it to seem like an instrument. We want it to have that same mastery and skill level to demonstrate it, but we also strive for that seamless integration where it doesn't break if something goes wrong in the room. Connectivity, for instance, Wi-Fi, is a pain in my butt whenever I'm doing things like this. When I'm running my workshops, everything disconnects all the time. And that can lead to a poor user experience. Another commonality that we find mainly in audio technology and in the audio industry is this idea of mastery. And the kind of pride people can hold in the industry around being a Pro Tools master, being an Ableton wizard, or being an audio witch. But really, uh, we need to think about, is there too much glorification in what we see in the technology industry a lot is like being a 10X developer or a JavaScript ninja or however you want to do it, whether you're a rock star or whatever. But the idea is that we earn this badge of honor by th working through difficult user experiences and expect other people to do the same, otherwise they're not a real developer or a real digital musician or a real electronic performer until they fought those battles too. And that can be really damaging because you're actually turning around and telling a lot of people away from your technology when you're leaving those things as battles to fight. Because if they don't succeed, they're very likely to discontinue using your thing altogether. And maybe we shouldn't build stuff around this, around such lofty ideals. We should strive to work smart and create simple, elegant and understandable interactions that work and make users' lives easier. 
And this is where assumptions can be very, very dangerous. Who's heard of this saying before? A lot of people in the room, I'm glad. To make an assumption is to make an ass out of you and me. When we learn about making assumptions, whether that's just about a user's knowledge level of a specific concept within a door, what we can often do is choose to say, oh, you don't know this, so you don't deserve to interact with my technology. And actually, we still have a long way to go in, in the audio industry, especially uh, between the beginner level introductory interactions and the expert pro applications that we build. So having a look at what these elements have in similarities and together, let's think about the different types of audio tech experiences individually. What do we have when we're making music? Well, we have different hardware choices. We have lots of electronic options for today in digital musical ma music makers. Uh, so from the conventional synthesizer to uh, polychromatic instruments uh, that allow for tonal representation that's just different and more flexibility. And a number of these can be classified into a kind of three distinct groups. You have key-based interfaces, pad-based interfaces, and gestural instruments. Whereas the software for music making can be like so much more diverse. There are thousands of apps that are out there for digital music making. Um, who's seen the application Bloom? Great. It's I actually really, it, Bloom is one that was created um, in partnership with Brian Eno, and it's a really, really nice interactive audio experience, but it can be used as a performance tool. And I have found in settings with young children with autism, they find it really engaging, but also enjoy that, that what they're doing is contributing to the soundscape in which other children are responding to them with. So there's all these different things that you can download and have in your pocket and start making music right away. And when we think about the hardware or the software, we, when we were designing for digital music making in terms of instrumentation, we're thinking about these three modalities. We're thinking about how do people create music in the first place? How do they just have an interface that invites them to experiment, to hit notes and make up a melody, to mess around, to be playful around the interaction? How do we then enable them to be able to practice what are we thinking about in terms of, do we allow them to record parts and learn from it? Do we have some kind of interaction that records their touch points on a, a touch screen or something that lets them practice and become virtuous? And then how do we enable them in performing? Do we change the mode? Do we simplify the UI? What do we do when we're thinking about those kind of interactions? But so many technologies are kind of modeled on the old school. Uh, and so it leads you to think, like, how were these designed? Have we always just taken different parameters of audio things and gone, well, a synthesizer had all of these potentiometers, so we should use those as a representation for the change of this parameter in a digital sense? Like, who married that and said that that was the absolute way? And it's maybe, in some respects, limited what people are exploring in music tech as well. And really, it's not exploiting all that new technologies have to offer. There are so many music applications that, that go beyond the keyboard. Uh, I can think of a few that I've interacted with, things like the React table, uh, gestural instruments like the Mimu gloves and Glovers. I've been fortunate enough to be working as a tech for one of the Glovers in the room at the Lula. Give everybody a wave right at the back there. Um, so I've been fortunate to, to follow these technologies around and understand what are people doing with them? What are people doing when there is limitless sound? For the Glovers, they get to decide what, what postures, what choices. Um, I'm saying me move Gloves and Glovers. Does, has anybody in the room not heard of these before? OK. Uh, Imogen Heap created a, a digital MIDI controller that uses bend sensors in fingers, it uses an accelerometer, a gyroscope, and some other nice, cool sensors in the gloves as well. They talk to uh, Ableton, and you can map them using the Glover software. They recognize the postures that musicians form. They get to choose postures, um, like one of Lula's favorites is the rabbit, that you get to use 
in making that action turn into a sound and controlling parameters within Ableton or other things as well. You can actually hook them up to uh, other programs like Max and, and control things. So it's another way of controlling, but it's also taking it out of the box of this is a pad or a musical instrument and thinking what would people do in the free space? If they have limitless choice, is that too much overwhelm or are people doing the same thing over and over again? Uh, one of the things that I've spoken at, at length with the Glover team is that I'd be really interested to see if each of the 25 people that owns a pair of these gloves assigns the same motion to a specific musical interaction. Because it's interesting to know whether we still have these bounds and biases as to what means what. But the reason that people don't step beyond the keyboard often is because of this. It's familiarity. We're really predictable as humans. Uh, we like forms and shapes of things that we've seen before, that are familiar to us. We have unconscious biases about the world that we don't even know about, and we struggle to explain why we might prefer something resembling a keyboard over a, like a space-age glowing orb that can act as a musical interface. But it is because of this sense of familiarity. We've seen it a thousand times. Mimetic gestures tell us a lot about this. So, for instance, I'm doing this, you think I'm playing a piano. I'm doing this, or this, to play the world's tiniest violin. And this transfers across cultures. It's ingrained into our very existence. And you can use these mimetic gestures over a wide range of things, and most people can understand that's what you mean, because music has existed for hundreds of years. But the technologies that we're working with today to w interact with music are so very fresh in our eyes. And there's a such small users that have had the chance to become pros. So talking about the pro side of audio, what about editing music digitally? Again, we have hardware interfaces that are designed for this, modeled off old Neve desks, um, or assignable pads that we might, might, might want to use to change through scenes in Ableton or DJ controllers. And then we have the software that goes with it. We very much see a similarity in most softwares. We have a gridded area of a timeline that represents the change of audio and the tracks over time. And then we have other parameters that usually appear on the bottom of the screen to indicate something we're interacting with or the waveform zoomed in. Or it's, it's quite predictable. Once you know your way around one door, you can kind of find your way around the others. And again, that's a sense of familiarity. It's because these actions as well are often based on a physicality. So when we're looking for how to make a cut in an editing tool, we're looking for the scissors, we're looking for something that represents tape splicing. We often just default to these physical actions that we knew in the history of audio recording. And in this space, this is where especially that gap between beginner and expert is a mountain. There are so many musicians that start to learn Ableton or start to learn Pro Tools, and they see somebody who's a pro navigating, like, how do you do that? Like, it's magic. But it is perseverance with a lot of these things, and there are things we could be doing to make the user experience much easier. Um, but there, again, is the sense of mastery and the sense of protecting some kind of knowledge and holding that close and making it difficult to not go from being a beginner to an expert. Sometimes we aren't doing enough to help the people in the intermediate. They're stuck in the clouds and they're not getting any further. And forums would uh, often, uh, there's, there's many that you would find yourselves on that would often berate people for not knowing stuff. And we're very often the first people to criticize instead of lift other people up and share knowledge. So what do we know about UX in audio technology? I'm going to talk you through a few things that are very interesting. First thing is icons. We have very, like many classic icons that we associate with audio tools, from potentiometers to linear faders to nodes that we use to manipulate EQ. And I think that we need to start thinking about the why of these things. What 
is there other controllers or icons that could better visually represent what we're doing? When we're talking about beginner spaces in digital musical instruments, do we, does the person need to understand that they're manipulating a fader? Could it be something else? Could it be a color change? Could it be uh, a gesture across the screen? Could it, could it be that we change these and the whole causality relationship actually stays intact? It would be interesting as an experiment to see what people might do if we removed some of these icons and whether they would still know initially what they were doing with those controls. Another thing that we've seen is that layout, it, it's changing vastly because we need to consider what to do with screen estate when everything is changing from being on a, a laptop that first they got bigger and then they got smaller and now they're somewhere in between again. And then phones doing the same thing and tablets as well. And this is all, again, very contextual. Perhaps um, we change the layout between a practice and performance in a digital musical instrument to minimize the risk of mistriggering something. And perhaps we have a more full view on a laptop that you can edit that if impacts the view on your mobile. Like, what are we doing to um, simplify those layouts for less cognitive load? And how are we uh, addressing things? Are we doing things like bigger target areas on touch devices to, to make those interactions uh, more easy to, to maneuver? Gestures are equally interesting as well, and they are loaded with expectations of users as well. So one of the things that we might assume with swipes is moving through context or changing parameters. Circular motions could be fast forward or to change a potentiometer and tap to play or tap to change the BPM, or those things as well. And pairing those incorrectly can result in user expectations being challenged, and it easily leads from somebody being like, this is like going from too far in the wrong way, and you easily get to, this is broken, it doesn't work. Imagine if you press something and it even plays just a few milliseconds after your key press. It's, it's an expectation that when it isn't met, it just completely breaks what the user believes in the technology and its ability. And that could be even if you designed it to behave that way. But who decided what these associations are in the first place? One of the questions that I often ask in my research is, does up always equal more? We have this association, changing the level of something, because we've seen it on volume controllers, this motion we expect if I did this, you would be quiet, and if I did this, you would be loud. It's just something that is culturally ingrained. And in my research, the answer to this question is actually most of the time, no. I create tailored interactions to users' ability, and sometimes that means that their biggest range isn't on the y-axis, in the vertical, but in the horizontal, in the, in the x-axis. So the up is more encoding just doesn't work here, because they can't interact in that way. And so to them, it could be that the left to right is more, or depending on the strength in their movement, whichever direction they are strongest in is where they see increase in volume should occur. So it's definitely an interesting point to consider. What happens when we go against these expectations? Also, psychoacoustics, how we perceive sounds. Thinking about things like the impact of audio delays here, or the direction of sound, or temporal processing, and a fun twist is that even when our perceptions are wrong, we think that they're right. So we often perceive ourselves to be clapping on a beat. But most humans hit actually up to 100 milliseconds before the beat. Um, we're asynchronous most of the time. Uh, it's very rare that we're on time. And we anticipate the beat before it happens. And that's something that we do when we're processing sounds. And that time displacement isn't enough for us to realize that we're doing this, but it is something that if you're using, for instance, uh, gestural sensing by a wearable, you might see an electro signal from nerves happening prior to the interaction, should, prior to when uh, a gesture should happen. There's some interesting research in gestural drum beats and air, air beats in terms of like interactions with air and expecting the same response as hitting a pad. And how do we design that interaction so it physically works on a psychoacoustic level? So it's something you need to consider, like the potential of this offset in your design. So how am I looking at these kind of interactions and how people are 
experiencing technology and what do I learn from it. So one of the things I do is I go into these community projects, I observe users. We set up a, a group of students with a range of uh, abilities, um, anywhere aged up to 19. Uh, we, t t we spend five full intensive days with them, creating music together, using traditional and digital instruments. Um, so I've had a chance to take technology probes in, I have been gifted things to take into the research and to test with young people with disabilities. And we, we see how they do. We never make a decision about the musical choice of the content. And as a musician, as somebody who's done uh, a lot of engineering before, I found this really hard to take in in meetings, like what you don't do anything to inform the creative direction. The only thing that is ever done is a key is chosen, which is C or relative A minor, because it's, it's, it's a happy accident key. If anything happens, it should be harmonic. So we sometimes key lock devices that have the possibility to do that, to make it happen so that they can create sounds together. And then we record some parts. We create unconventional scoring because for some of these users, it's not possible to give them a tab or a specific note scoring and explain those processes to them. Everything is new and everything is an ex like an experience that we're designing around them. And then we uh, mix some of these recorded sounds into Ableton. We create some kind of backing for them to then perform along to live. And then we take that into a live performance. And we do everything, including uh, sort of Foley sound recordings of their wheelchairs and things that they like really take as an identifier and make everything about them as a person part of that creative process. And it's given us some really interesting things to consider and challenges to overcome. The non-visual interaction, how do we ensure that somebody knows that they're interacting with something if it's not within their field of view? Is there a part of your technology where you would know that you're clicking the thing without knowing about it? How does your technology work with a screen reader? Have you tested that? It's very, very interesting. Who's heard a screen reader on an iPad before? A few of you in the room. It's incredibly fast. The interaction to hear what the control is is a single tap. So if you have a single tap interaction in your program, that becomes a double tap. So then you have to think of the knock-on effect of other things and in how you interact with, with that and what that changes about your interaction. Then we have multiple user requirements. There is no one size fits all when it comes to these uh, workshops and that isn't how musicianship should be either. Every musician who uses the technology is unique in their own right and likes to perform things in their own way. We use so many different devices, networks, and operating systems, and connecting them is hell. Um, if you're working in that realm of making it easier to connect devices, thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, things like Ableton Link make some things easier. Touchable as well we've used. Um, but it is still a, a, a real crux point for taking a lot of technology into a space and interacting with it in a live setting. There's also considerations of orientation and position in space. Sometimes things only work in the vertical on an iPad and or the horizontal if it's keys. And often we just, we just do away with this idea that it has to be that way and just put it at whatever works for the user. And like I said, we have these unconventional scoring systems and creating a common understanding between each of the instruments that they're using and what, what those are and what their contribution to parts are. And throughout that whole process as well, we have roles that change. As, a, as somebody who's a researcher in this space, I often go from facilitating an interaction to fixing something in Ableton to then like leading the procession of people doing a musical thing. It's so much context switching. And when you have technology that doesn't help you do that easily, it's a huge, huge problem for us. And often will mean that I can't use your application in this because it's, it takes too long for me to go from a to B with it. It needs to be plug in and play, or I'm going to choose a different thing. So what's next for me in that research sphere? Well, I am creating a facilitating access to musical experiences framework, something that can be used by people who are facilitators in these spaces that don't have the time to read an entire academic thing and can use um, a, an accessible tool and also some guidance on how to uh, pick the right digital musical instrument for them. Which leads to the Accessible Instrument Finder and Community, which is something I'm developing online, and I am classifying instruments and going through all the tools out there and trying to 
show what are the accessibility features that they have and what they don't have and who they're best paired with. And that's also leading into exploring the tailoring of digital musical instruments and audio editing software as well. What can we do to make these more accessible? What can we do, what does the technology currently allow for? And is there things that we could be lobbying software companies to be doing to think about inclusivity in this way? And one of the things I talked about with the gloves, is there a taxonomy of musical gestures? Now we're moving into a, an era where there is gesture technology and things that are different ways of interacting with sound. How are we making their a standard? How are we saying to people, these are the th common things that people do, and so should become the things that you make like use of? One of the things that Lula always comments on in the gloves is it's so important to have a mute, to be able to stop the gloves from sending data just so you don't mistrigger them if you decide to stop and talk or to do something. How do we say to people, right, you have to have this as an option, it's really important. And also, um, I'm, I'm working with industry partners and research collaborators to, to get as much information about this space as possible. So what about the things that you can do today? Well, it starts really with asking yourself a lot of questions. So when you're thinking about the technology that you develop, what context is it being used in? Does it have to do context switching? Are there things where you might be interacting with something as a creator and a performer, or as a musician and an editor? Like, how do the people who wear these different hats interact with it and feel the connection that you feel when you're going from a piano to an audio editor? Like, how do you make sure that that, that is intact and that that interaction stays secure? Does the visual representation of what I'm doing make sense here? Is it easy to understand? Am I assuming knowledge about the things that I've put in there? Have I chosen a potentiometer because everybody knows what one of those is? Some people have only ever seen something like that as a dial on an old school stereo with a tape deck to turn volume up. And does up always mean more? What are we thinking about in terms of our visual representation? Can we increase the options for personalization of technology? What are we doing inside of the application we've built to say, hey, how about having a changed color UI because the current UI that we have has one color scape. And that color scape is bad for anybody with a visual impairment because the contrast is low. Are you checking for those things in the first place or are we just trying to make it look like a slick pro audio app? How much are we trading off for that? And is there an option where we could just change that UI really, really simply? And what are we doing to help increase mastery? So how are you taking people who might be the first time like person coming to your application and landing in it? Maybe even they came there by accident because it is a tool that's mainly used by professionals. But what are you doing to secure their input when they first land on your, on your tool and move forward into becoming a master? Do you have a lot of community support? Do you have people who are doing training? Do you offer all of this kind of support through good technical documentation on your websites? What is it that you're doing to support mastery and becoming a master? And then who will be using my product? Is my product likely to be used by somebody with an accessibility need? I can tell you the answer to that question is yes. Because 19% of the world's population has a registered disability, according to the World Health Organization. That's 19% that have registered. There are many, many more people out there who have not disclosed things to institutions because of the fear of biases against them. So this is, what, one in five people? So think about building with that in mind. Then think about designing the right testing. Are you doing persona walkthroughs of your application? Are you testing the modes? Are you seeing what it does with mobile interactions? And are you testing it on different devices? Are you sticking with something like GOMS analysis, which is goals, operations, methods, and selection, and sticking with a very linear time value? Are you considering what your icons and layouts are doing to impact that? And are you doing the most important thing of all? Are you getting users in to test it? And especially, 
are you getting users that represent everybody who, who could be a music maker to do that, including people with an accessibility requirement? Whether that's in person, doing A-B testing, or just doing surveys with your user base. Know that there's no one size fits all solution and that tailoring is key in providing options to people who use these technologies. And please, if I can encourage you to do anything today, build with accessibility as a foundation, not a feature to add on later. It makes it much harder, believe me, when you try and fix something that's buggy for someone with an accessibility requirement. Let's build better things. Thank you. Hey, we've got a couple of minutes for questions. Any questions? Hi, thank you very much for your talk. Very, very inspiring. Um, you talked about gestural interaction, gestural controllers, the MIMO gloves, and then in one of the uh, latest slides, you talked about uh, finding taxonomies of gestures mm -hmm. and then personalizations and all that. But uh, establishing a taxonomy of gest musical gestures that so a musicians could use and many others, is it not kind of going against the personalization of gestures? Can we not maybe end up in a situation which musicians will use all of them the same gestures and so how we can then let them create with their own gestures if we push the idea of taxonomy? Yeah, so whether, I, th I think there's an interesting point in how much option is too much option? Because when you give anybody a free field, a blank text editor, when you're about to write a program or an open email with nothing written in it, everybody faces that sense of overwhelm of where to start. And I think having a, an understanding of, of, yes, the commonalities that we see in perhaps old audio technologies that we're carrying through, like flogging a dead horse into, into digital technology that has so many more capabilities, um, like there is danger of doing that by classifying gestures and say, well, everybody uses it this way, so you should do that. Um, but at the same time, without having a, a general understanding and understanding what, what musicians do, kind of informs us as to what might feel intuitive. Like intuitive is a very subjective word as well. So you, you enter like really dangerous territory in this research and you have to, like assumption is something that we have to really try and stay away from. Um, but definitely trying to understand different cultural uses of the technology and like me sitting in on the sessions that I do is trying to understand where are the problem points and what can I do to help fix those. And understanding gestures in, in a taxonomy way would be like, what do people do with this thing? And what can we do to them better the technology so they can do that better? Like, can I make it stronger that this button to stop is always like a, a much stronger link. Can we change a gesture? Can we give people more postures? Can we inform something about the machine learning element that makes it stronger for these actions to always result in the right thing that the user expects? So it's kind of trying to understand it from that point of view, um, not trying to box people in and say, you should always use a finger point to say stop. Like that's, yeah, that's a bad way of doing it. <laughs> Any more questions? Um, I think this oh. one. Sorry, I'm making you run. <laughs> Hiya. Um, it's often the case in other areas of design where you build accessibility into the foundations and it makes it easier for everyone as well, not just the people like with more like specialized needs. Mm -hmm. So uh, are you or do you know if anyone's done any research or when you make audio apps that do build this in, whether they gen you know, they are easier to use, not just for um, yeah. So there's only so much scope of one PhD. <laughs> I am a single person. There's not, I, I think there's not many other people doing what I do in the world, and that sometimes makes it a very isolating space. But yes, uh, my supervisor often tells me off for being interested in all of the things that could happen. But definitely you've seen, we've seen trends in technology where building accessibility doesn't just improve it for those that have accessibility requirements, but for every user and it improves the experience overall. I would really love to run some studies on what, that hap what happens 
whether that happens in audio technologies or whether that negates some things or whether some people uh, assume that making something accessible is perhaps dumbing down the user experience in some way. I would be really interested in seeing what happens with that um, and running some studies, but I think that's a, that's a postdoc option maybe. <laughs> Anybody else? Any other questions? Okay, I think that's great. Thanks, Amy. Thank you so much.